Hello and welcome back to our discussion to this second lecture uh, covering chapter two, okay? Um, and it's the physics of everyday phenomena. So we are talking about describing motion um, and one thing that I haven't said, a term that I haven't mentioned, um, is the term kinematics. So I wanted to uh, present that real quickly. So describing motion, the title of the chapter, is the same as saying kinematics. So kinematics is simply the word that means the description of motion, the study of motion, kinematics. Okay? All right. You know, some subcategory of physics. All right. So we had not gotten too much into the content. I spent a long time talking about the overall unit on Newtonian mechanics and a lot of introduction time. So we should get to it. And we've spent plenty of time on unit conversion. And if you want to see uh, a initial example on unit conversion, please look at the previous video for chapter two. Okay. So we want to now define average speed. Okay. So average speed, remember speed is distance over time. Well, average speed is just taking a total distance and then a total time. That's it. It's not, say, averaging individual speeds. Because, well, would you measure one speed for a minute and another speed for an hour and then take the average of the two? No, right? Um, unless you accounted for something like that. Instead, it's, we just, it's the grand total of distance and the grand total of elapsed time, how much time has passed, and that's it, okay? So for example, we have uh, one here. Obviously, this is not a straight path, right? So that, that we can think of this as multiple trips, one trip being from Phoenix to Flagstaff, which is 140 miles and is completed in 2.6 hours. And you can see this most clearly, I think, if you just look at the map, right? So I'm just thinking of this first um, you know, segment of the trip. Then from Flagstaff to Kingman, um, Kingman, or um, rather going the other way, Kingman to Flagstaff is how it's showing. Um, but then Flagstaff to Phoenix, okay? So now going the correct direction is the one I talked about, okay? Um, and then the total trip is just the sum, the, so the 120 miles and the 140, and then the sum of the elapsed time, the 2.4 hours and the 2.6, and that's it. So it simply comes down to 260 divided by five. And that gives us our 52 miles per hour. That would be our average speed over the entire trip. We would have a different average speed if we were just averaging, say, you know, the segment from Kingman to Phoenix, right? Um, or sorry, King, Kingman to Flagstaff, because that would be a smaller segment and it, you know, there was different, different average speeds, okay? So it is absolutely relative to when you choose and, and, and choose to you know, begin and stop, okay? All right, 52 miles, yep, is, is definitely not the, you know, not the same as the, as the average of the two, okay? Um, and I already said that, right? Why, why did I say it? Why is this also in the slides? The reason is because this is such a common mistake um, because people hear average speed and they think, oh, I'm averaging a set of numbers, right? But you are, but it's a, a set of bigger numbers, right? Instead, you're just gonna take the grand total, like I said, grand total distance, grand total time, okay? Um, if you were to average the two speeds, the two separate speeds, which you can see in the first uh, leg of the journey, it was 50 miles per hour, and the second leg of the journey, it was 53.8, right? Neither, neither of those is the, you know, the overall 52 that we got, right? Because in other words, you were going a little bit slower on the first, first leg of the journey, a little bit faster on the second, or maybe the road allowed for it. But um, the point is, if you were just to average those two, well, you wouldn't, you wouldn't get the correct number of 52. Why is that, right? Well, because you didn't account for the different distances. Because you averaged the 50, mile, the 50 miles per hour for, you know, um, for, you know, uh, not distances, excuse me, but you didn't, um, uh, distances actually, yeah, because they're different distances. One is 120 miles, the other is 140, but also the times, right? In other words, you would need a weighted average. Okay, you would need you need to account for that that one one of those legs of the journey is longer than the other. Okay, if you were to take that weighted average, which would be unnecessarily complex, you would end up getting the exact same result of the 52, because that that's what taking the grand total distance and grand total time is. Okay, so that's average speed. Okay, it's a it's a rate. Right, there is one of many examples of rates. Um, I mentioned acceleration in the introduction. That's another rate. Okay. Um, that is a that's a rate of change of something itself that is a rate, you know. So we have a rate on a rate of a rate. We have lots of other rates like power, wattage, many many examples of rates. Okay, um, gallons per minute, pesos per dollar, points per game. Right. So things out of physics. You know, I of course gravitate to ideas in physics. Okay. 
So average speed is a rate in which distance is covered over time, okay? And it's really kind of the simplest of all the motion um, rates out there. That's why we start with it, okay? Now, instantaneous speed is not taking any average, okay? Instead, it's just measured at a moment in time, okay? So it's at some precise instant, all right? It is the rate at which distance is being covered at that given instant in time, okay? So it's found by calculating the average speed over a short enough time that the speed does not change much. You see that? And that's interesting, right? Because really, like, how would you measure something that is truly instantaneous, you know? Because that means that you'd have to be, you know, measuring it in some segment of time that is infinitely small. You can't actually do that in practice, right? So it's more of just a very, very, you know, tight average, a very, you know, changing average because it's, it's measured over such a short amount of time, all right? And we'll say this again in the lecture where um, I talk in the same chapter about graphs of motion, so graphs that describe motion. And I'll talk about this idea of secant lines and tangent lines, and that's, that's what this is, okay? So it averages a secant line. It's gonna connect two points, and it's just a straight line between two points on a graph. A instantaneous value is a tangent line. It just kisses the curve because it represents the instantaneous slope at that point, at that coordinate, right? So let me just quickly show you um, what this would look like, uh, right, in a little sketch. So if I had a, and, you know, getting ahead of ourselves a little bit here, hopefully you can forgive me for, you know, showing a graph um, before we get properly to the section on graphs, all right? But what we're looking at here is, uh, let's see, we want to, we're talking about distance, we're interested in speed, right? So what we have here is we have distance on the vertical axis, that's what's called our, our dependent variable because it's going to be dependent on whatever value is on the horizontal axis. So this is a graphical rela relationship between the two. It's showing distance as a function of, well, what's, what's on the, the horizontal axis? It's time, okay? Because that's the input, the independent variable. You also always want to put units on a graph like this, so seconds on time and distance in meters. Those are the base units for both time and distance, okay? Which are, you know, fundamental quantities, um, you know, what are called physical dimensions of, that we use in physics, okay? It's only a few. Um, all that aside though, you know, so we have something that is, is sh uh, moving, right? So it, this is just a, a, a plot, if you will, of where something is as time passes. And if you imagine, you know, some car that, that speeds up a little bit and then slows down for a while, kind of coasts along and then speeds up again. Well, its, it's distance graph might look something like this. So it would be kind of flatten out and then start curving up again, right? So this is a car that's, that's you know, speeding up, slowing down. And if that doesn't make immediate sense, that's fine. We'll talk about how you would interpret a graph to match that, that mind's eye picture that I'm describing for you, this idea of a car speeding up, coasting, you know, and then speeding up again. But point being, the reason I wanted to show this now and introduce, introduce, introduce an idea that I will reiterate again, especially in these other chapters, is this idea then that if I'm looking at this, this plot and I have two points, right, these correspond to different moments in time, right? So you can think of this as just, you know, time one, and then later on you have this point which is time two, right? So maybe this is one second after the stopwatch starts. You know, that's, that's kind of how we imagine this. This is some sort of event, right? As we're paying close attention to tracking the race car or something, the racers, whatever it may be. But so you have some, some time, okay? It's not, not zero, just some time, and you have some later time, okay? And so if you're then interested in the, well, the speed between, between the, that, those times, right, between the beginning time and the, and the end time, so between T1 and T2, then that's the average speed. Okay, the app, well, if you're interested in average speed between them. If you say between them, it has to, that's what you're doing, you're taking an average. And the average, as I said, is the secant, and a secant is just connects, is a way to connect dots, okay? So that's a term you heard in the math class, that's great. If you haven't, um, it's, it's just a term that, that means connecting two dots on a graph, two, two points, okay? Because of course these time points correspond to some particular distance, which you would also, you know, you would, you'd be able to, you know, quantify that based on what you know about the motion, right? This is some, we could call this, you know, x1, right? And up here would be x2, right? Some coordinates, right? How far you're moving along, okay? I think, and if you're thinking vertical axis is y, well, you know, that's, that's not like an xy graph, right? But here, these, this is vertical axis and horizontal axis, by the way, okay? So this is the average. So the slope here, you have the slope of this, of this line, 
Okay, remember slope is just a number, right? Average speed is just a number. The slope is the average speed, okay? Now, interestingly here, it would be the, the absolute value of the slope is the average speed, okay? I'm gonna write that down because it, that's relevant. So the slope is, on the, so it's the absolute value, okay, of the average speed. So, make space for that. So absolute value of the average speed. Okay, or rather the absolute value of the slope is the average speed. So absolute value of the slope is precisely equal to, so here we'll have it, well then we'll just put the equal sign right here. All right, witness to the process here. Okay, we got, okay, so the absolute value of the slope is equal to the average speed. Right? Now what I mean by that, and this is gonna be a key idea that will come up in just a moment, that's what sets speed apart from velocity, okay? Because velocity can be either negative or positive in this one dimensional case, because this is just something either you know, moving in a straight path, right? Like I said, as a car, drive, you know, imagine driving on a straight road, and it's, all it's doing is speeding up and slowing down, okay? There's no turning to the left or the right, right? There's no going you know, higher elevation or lower elevation, it's one dimensional, all right? That's a great way to start talking about motion. We, we won't worry about two dimensional motion for a little bit, but we'll get there. Point being though, is that that means that, that in velocity, this concept that is speed plus direction, okay, that's what velocity is, well, the way that that's represented is either having a positive slope or a negative slope, where a positive slope is going to be forward, however you define forward, okay, and then a negative slope is backwards, okay, the opposite of forwards. So in this case though, we're talking about speed, speed doesn't have that information built into it, speed is just a number. It doesn't tell you where you're heading, it doesn't tell you whether you're going backwards or forwards in this case, okay? All right, hence it's the absolute value, right? But, point, or just, you know, you just ignore the negative if you wanna think of it as like, because absolute value sounds like it's overcomplicating it. You're just ignoring the negative, you just care about the number, okay? If, if it happened to be negative, in this case, positive slope, in my example, would actually give you a positive value, okay? And remember slope, by the way, is just rise of a run, okay? So if, you, if you're kind of um, drawing a blank on being like, okay, that's great that here you have this numerical equivalence, right? That the value of the slope is just is the speed, right? Um, the average speed. Then, you know, what, how, do you, how do you actually get there though, you know? Well, what you'd have is you'd say, okay, you would then just simply calculate it. You would then say that the slope is equal to the change in displacement or distance, right? X2 minus X1, right? So X2 is the final point where you ended, x, x1 is the initial point where you started, so the, the, the difference between them, okay? x2 minus x1, and then likewise, elapsed time, these are both gonna be positive values, is just t2 minus t1, okay? So that's, that's gonna give you a slope, all right? So that's, that's the calculation of it. Now, I said that this was you know, in service to explaining the difference between average slope and um, instantaneous, or rather average speed and instantaneous speed, um, but there's a lot else to, to explain. And again, it's such important ideas for understanding motion, and you can't understand physics without you know, getting to this point of motion. But let's look actually one of these two points, we'll choose T1. Now I say one because we're gonna look at this idea of instantaneous. Because instantaneous, it, which of course assumes that you, it really is just measuring over a very short time, is then gonna give us a very different value because it's gonna give us something that isn't a secant, but instead is a tangent. Okay, so the last one was the secant. That's, that's any line on a graph that connects two points, okay? But then, in this case, we have the tangent, all right? So this right here is the tangent. Now the tangent, its slope, is then precisely equal to the instantaneous speed. So let's go ahead and point that out. So the slope of the tangent at T1 is instantaneous speed at T1. All right, so there we have graphical representation, representation of the secant and the tangent, graphical representation of, respectively, the average speed and the instantaneous speed, okay? So that's, that's the key. Now, 
I didn't mention how to calculate the whole slope of the tangent because it's not just simply you know a difference over another difference, right? X two minus X one over T two minus T one. If you're going to actually calculate it, you would need to know this the the function, and you'd have to use calculus, right? And that's one of the the key reasons that calculus was developed at the same time that these physics were getting you know kind of officially written down and and, and thought of, you know, right? And organized into human consciousness. Okay, so. All that aside, let's get then back to a couple of examples of instantaneous speed and then move right on finally to velocity. And we'll wrap this video with velocity before we get to acceleration, okay? The natural stopping point. All right, so question, right? Think about all we've been talking about, make sure you can apply it. What does a car speedometer measure, right? And you know, maybe you're paying attention, I'm pretty sure I gave this as an example. What is it? Is it average speed, instantaneous speed, average velocity, or instantaneous velocity, okay? Well, it's instantaneous speed, speed, okay? Because it's not average speed, right? You can, you might have some option to calculate that, like you know, what was your average speed over some trip, right? You can log it within the, you know, the, you know, some part of the, the computer of the car. Um, but if you're looking at the speedometer at that moment, that's your instant, instantaneous speed. And it's, you know, sometimes people talk about the sample rate because if you have some digital sensor, maybe it, it's sampling the speed based on. Um, either GPS data or based on some movement of something within the car. Think of like, um, maybe that's kind of rudimentary, but that's how some bicycle speedometers work. They actually have a, they, they know the, the diameter that you put these two sensors, sensors um, you know, relative to the, the axis of the, of the wheel. And then it's going to just log it each time. And by knowing the period, it's then able to, you know, calculate how far you've gone and at what rate you're moving, right? Without, without GPS, right? There's other ways to calculate speed, in other words. Um, but all, all of that aside, um, even with fluid flow, by the way, which is a cool way to do it, uh, that's how airplanes do it. They track their speed relative to the air around them using just the actual movement of, of air rushing through confined spaces and causing pressure changes, all right? Um, but, right, instantaneous speed in all of those cases, all right? Not velocity, because you would need a compass, right? If you included the compass in your measurement, then those two measurements together, collectively, would be velocity, right? So the speedometer tells us how fast we are going at that given instant in time. This is speed, all right? So what about the highway patrol? Are they interested in that average speed or the instantaneous speed? What do you think? All right, so it's in instantaneous, right? Now, I mean, it, that means it's kind of interesting, right? Because like, what, what's the threshold, right? So, you know, so they, you know, it, could they then, could you argue against a, t a ticket because you said, sure, that's, that it was an instantaneous speed, but first of all, how do you know that that measurement was accurate if it was to say one measurement that was made you know, in a fraction of a second? Imagine the device, you know, maybe the, in this case, bouncing a, bouncing a sound wave um, off of a, or bouncing a laser um, off of a car and then you know, receiving the, 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 the signal back. You know, that's how these, you know, these sort of sensors work. Another way to measure speed, of course. And so in that case, um, using either sound waves or light waves, so in that case, then what's what's happening, right? Then, well, you're you're set with a case where we got maybe one measurement out of 100 per second, as I was saying, right? So many measurements measurements per second could just be you know a random variation, right? So you said, oh well, yeah, you had an instantaneous speed that was you know 89 miles 89 miles per hour, but then all the speeds in a very close amount of time around it were you know 50. Then you could you could you know reasonably throw that out, right? So there, is there actually definitely you know it's an idea where you think that. It, there, there's, there is you know, real physics here that would push up into the legal limit of what a speeding ticket is. Okay, so on to velocity. Said many times it's speed plus direction, okay? So velocity involves direction of motion as well as how fast the object is going. So it's still gonna have that number. It's still gonna have with the, the best base units for physics, meters per second, the one, ones we'll use the most, okay? And it is what's called a vector quantity. Okay, so vectors are a term that refers to any quantity like velocity. This is the first but not the last vector we will see in this class. Okay, we'll see a few other key ones like momentum. Okay, we'll see other key, and of course, maybe the most other important, most important vector is going to be force. Force is all about the direction that force pushes. Okay, and we can push up against directions a little bit in this class, but we're limited because we can't get into um, actually using trigonometry, right? Because we're, you know, we, we don't want to be burdened by the more complicated math in this class. So, but we'll still, we'll still touch on the idea that that force is also a vector, okay? Um, that said, there are lots of very important quantities that are scalars that don't, they don't have any meaning of direction. Like the way that we track energy, right? That's going to be a scalar quantity, like speed, 
okay? Um, however, speed you can think of as being kind of lesser than velocity because it's just velocity minus the direction, where is it, there's, no, there's no parallel for energy. You know, there's, there's no energy plus direction. And so it's kind of interesting that it, it, it stands on its own in a sense, right? Not to say that, that speed is, is not useful. It's just a different type of scalar, okay? And that term, by the way, for speed, which is just a number, and the, the name given to it, the, the correct key term is scalar, all right? Um, and on that, on that note, there is part of every one of your chapters that, um, in the textbook that has a very um, great list of the key terms. So you can see things like um, the term vector, all right? Um, you can see, so we actually, that's right. They didn't, your book, right, caught, caught here, right? Now, I, I said the word scalar, and that is the term, right? A scalar is just a number, okay? But you can see it, it was not included in your textbook for whatever reason, sometimes, right? Different authors and teachers decide to present different amounts of information, okay? Um, but a scalar is some, a value that only has magnitude, okay? So that just means a number, right? And does not have direction, okay? So a scalar has magnitude but no direction. Whereas a vector, well, a vector has both magnitude and direction. Right, but carrying on, care more about vectors, okay? Um, so velocity has a magnitude, the speed, okay? And also has direction, which way is it going, okay? Maybe it's given as an angle relative to east or something, you know? Right, or maybe an angle relative to the x-axis. A change in velocity can be a change in the object's speed or direction of motion or both. You see? So that means you can actually keep constant speed, and we'll come back to this, okay, but move to the side, right? So what that's, that's actually called uniform circular motion. It's this idea, right, that I, you're not slowing down or speeding up, but you're turning. You're, you know, so turning at a constant rate, okay? So, you know, around some, you know, imagine this, that this is the, you know, kind of the, the center of a circle, right? And you're just turning, turning around it at a constant rate, right? That's the, the center of the radius. So what, what is that, you know, what, is, what really is happening there? What's changing? Well, there is an acceleration. The acceleration um, itself is constant in length, um, but not in direction either. And it's called the centripetal acceleration. And so it's, it has a, a particular special way it can be calculated. Uh, we, will, we won't derive it, but we'll, well, you certainly will see the formula in this class, okay? So, but that's a, that's a great example of speed not changing, okay? No slowing down or speeding up, but just your direction changing. And the result being that you were accelerating. Turning, the very act of turning is acceleration. Which is interesting because you might be like, aren't we talking about velocity? But th by defining velocity, we've opened ourselves up to this idea that acceleration must involve turning. Turning at constant speed, right? That is a form of acceleration, right? So a speedometer doesn't tell us about that type of acceleration, okay? Because the, the speedometer would say, hey, you're, you're maintaining constant speed as you go through that turn, right? You know something's going on though, right? Because you can feel the turn. You know, you can tell that like that you know physics are at work when you're turning, even though your speedometer says nothing's happening, right, or nothing's changing, right. So you know, there's, there's a there's, there is an intuition. We can tell you know there's a sign that something's happening, and what's happening is that there is an acceleration, just one that your speedometer doesn't read because there's no change in speed. Okay. So a car goes around a curve at constant speed. Is the car's velocity changing? Answer this question for sure. Absolutely. Okay. That's what I was saying. Right? That is a change in velocity, not a change in speed. The speed would remain constant in this case, but the velocity would be changing. Okay? So turning around, you know, being ricocheted in the case of a ball bouncing off a wall shown in the figure here, that is also a case of changing velocity. In this case, a force allowed it to happen. Okay? Now I hinted a lot of forces. I said that they're the why behind motion. You can't get a change in velocity without a force. That's actually one of Newton's laws in a nutshell, right? Paraphrased. Right? So Let's read the slide together. A force is required to produce a change in either the magnitude or direction of velocity, okay? So you can't slow down or speed up without a force. That makes sense, right? Because you, you need an engine force to speed up, to keep going back to cars, right? You need a braking force to slow down, okay? But you also need a force to turn the car. That force isn't so much coming from the engine as the friction between the wheels and the road, but that force is still absolutely necessary, okay? Um, by the way, the fact that you want to get thrown out of the turn that, which is sometimes, sometimes called the centrifugal force, not to be mistaken with the centripetal force. Well, that's actually just inertia. I'll remind you about that when we get back to it. But forces aside, okay, the, the manifestation of them that we are focusing on in this chapter is a change in velocity, okay? So for a car to go around the turn, friction does it, all right? 
and that, that force is getting passed up to the axle of the car. For a, for a ball bouncing off a wall, the wall exerts a force, right? For, over a very short duration, but a non-zero duration of time, that causes a major change in velocity. We'll also talk about how that is useful to quantify as a change of momentum, because momentum is an interesting thing, okay? What is momentum? Well, wait, wait for another day. We'll come back to it. We don't need it right now, okay? So just like speed, velocity can be calculated in average and instantaneously, and it would, it would mean the same exact thing. So if I was to go, to, go back to my graph, right, then the, and I looked here and I said, okay, well, the only difference then between um, actually, you know, m measuring velocity is if these slopes were negative, then, then I would just account for it, right? So, um, and I could make a better example of that because if I had, say, my orange line here go up and back down, then we could imagine some other tangent line at some um, obviously much, much uh, greater time, T3, okay? So much later along, right? At that point, that moment in time along this, this path of a car, and again, interpreting the graph here, which we'll have more practice with, this would be the car actually turning around or maybe actually reversing. So again, imagine like this is like a drag racer or something, right? This car is going perfectly straight. I mean, they were, go they were going straight, you know, they, they sped up and they kind of coasted and then they sped up again and then they, like, they, come, they came to actually as a really sudden stop, right? Their velocity hit zero, okay? because the velocity is the tangent line, the instantaneous, the instantaneous speed, if we're just looking at its magnitude, okay? But then, and then they started going backwards, you know? It screeched to a stop, and now they're going backwards, straight backwards, okay? So then, if we looked at the slope at this moment, going, going backwards, well, that, that slope, okay? That, which, again, would be the slope of the tangent line, the instantaneous speed, if we just look at it, its magnitude, right? If we drop the negative. But here we don't, right? So we have a negative slope, which means a negative velocity, okay? How do we know it's negative? Because if we were just calculated the same way, right? If we just you know, did x2, x2 minus x1 over t2 minus t1, well, when you, when you plug that in, you would have that x2 is smaller than x1 because you've gone in the negative x direction. That's the whole way that the, that the math ties in with the graphs. So the graph matches the math, you know? And so going, you know, going in this direction, you just naturally get a negative in the, the numerator of that simple formula. The, t, the T2 minus T1 is never going to give you a negative because that's just going forward in time, okay? And it will always be, give you a positive, but it will affect the, the magnitude, you know, because it's longer time, different averages, right? Um, but of course, I, here I am actually talking about averages. You might be like, oh, when we're talking about instant, instantaneouses, instantaneous values, I guess I just wanted to show you that you could calculate it and, and justify where the negative comes from. By the way, if I, if I was to do a average, it would simply be a matter of, say, choosing two points, and I could still certainly get a case where the average would be negative, right? So this would just be the average between you know, some, some two points that I chose. And that would be a secant, still negative, negative velocity, and there would be a negative average velocity, okay? So this graph then, considered in this way, this secant, including the sine of the slope, in this case positive, and this secant, okay, which is a negative slope, okay, would, tell, would give you cases of positive velocity and negative velocity, okay? So, it's the same graph, and going from speed to velocity is not a big change in how we're interpreting it, right? So that's, that's what instantaneous velocity is, okay? It, can just, it just has that sign. All right, so we got, um, I said we'd talk about acceleration um, or in the next video, so I definitely want to pause and do that. Uh, when we do talk about acceleration, we're going to have uh, chances to consider how, it, how acceleration ties in with uh, motion in general. One of the big kind of culminating equations is this one right up top. This x equals x naught, that's initial position, plus v naught, which is initial velocity, times how much time has passed, plus one half the acceleration, which is, which is meters per second per second, because it's a change in velocity, and then the time that's passed squared. So this equation, which intimidates people up front, I hear that a lot from my students, um, is simply a matter of kind of bringing together ideas of velocity and acceleration, and it's going to be the culminating thing that we can do with um, this study of kinematics, all right? Um, but of course, to get there, we need to talk about um, acceleration, which we'll introduce formally, you know, certainly touched on it, but we'll introduce it formally in the next video, okay? So stay, stay tuned for that one, and I hope this video um, introducing um, speed, average speed, formally and, all, all, and its relationship to graphs, okay? And, to get, again, getting, I, I, you know, I said I am getting ahead, right? You know, it's obviously something we're supposed to save to the later half of the chapter. And then also talking about velocity. That was the takeaway here. Speed, velocity, difference between them, okay? All right, so see you all later. Bye for now.